Do the epistles of Romans and James contradict each other? This question seems to be the most controversial one when it comes to the issue of justification by faith in Christianity and deeply separates Protestants, Catholics, and Orthodox theologians who, offer, who often consider opposing positions heretical. Yet both epistles declare that we are either saved by faith while faith without works is dead. Does James undermine Protestantism or does Romans undermine Catholicism orthodoxy? If neither, how do we reconcile both sentiments and truly understand salvation as the Bible wants us to? All right. So, um, I love this question and I think the answer, my, my, my blunt answer to do the epistles of Romans and James contradict each other is no. Um, they do not contradict each other. My slightly more com complex answer is no, but um, they are unquestionably addressing very, very different uh, aspects of the Christian calling, the Christian life, the nature of pistis faith, right? Um, which is a kind of belief or trust. Um, let me see if I can unpack my understanding of this. Um, and, and, and then I'll say what it means for us about scripture and about the kind of, uh, denominational or, uh, sectarian questions that you raised. Right. So, um, first and foremost, right. Uh, pistis in Greek, pisteo as a verb, um, is a, a kind of trust that is, you know, more entire than perhaps we think of when we think of faith. Right. Um, Protestants are guilty of this. We think of faith as a set of propositional assents, right? I assent to this proposition and to this proposition and to this proposition. Um, in fact, pisteo is closer to, you know, I, I, I rely upon this. I rely upon you, right? When Christ says, believe in me, right? I rely, I rely upon a person, um, in, which is God in the person of Christ, right? Um, as truthful and as the source of truth and as somebody that I can always come back to as a touchstone of truth. Um, if you think about this for a second, you will notice uh, that although it is possible to sit around and, you know, assent intellectually to a thing, um, actual true faith, right, true assent or trust or belief in either a person or an idea um, inevitably will have implications for your actions. If I say that I believe the earth is flat and then I take a round trip flight uh, that travels east from uh, New York to China and then from China to California, right? If I take that flight, um, and then I go back still traveling East to New York, right? Um, I have in some sense revealed by my actions, something very serious and real about my pistis, about my belief, uh, which is, which was an intellectual assent to a proposition, right? Um, and that is that it, it doesn't, it wasn't really a thing, right? This is what faith without works is dead means, right? My faith was either empty or weak or something, right? And, and this is why, of course, um, you know, martyrdom is such a profound statement of faith is because it means sticking to your faith, um, in, in manifesting it in, in the here and now. Um, now the, if I say to myself, you know, I believe that the earth is round and then I take that big flight around the world, then uh, one thing I know um, is is that the only reason I've taken the flight around the world and not worried that I was going to fall off into some kind of like chasm of uh, of space time or something. Um, the only reason I've taken that flight is because of my belief, right? I've taken it because I believe propositionally uh, in my mind uh, and because I trust the person who told me that the earth is round. I have may have never seen the curvature of the earth, right? Some people have seen it in some context, but uh, when I first took a flight when I was a kid, I had never seen the curvature of the earth, but I trusted, I believed believed in my parents and therefore I believed in what they said and therefore I acted in a way that implied that, um, which showed that my belief was real. One way of thinking about this might be, um, that, you know, we've talked a lot about form and matter, right? That you can't have a circle say, uh, except a wooden circle or a, or a metal circle or a circle in ink, right? Or one that you imagine drawn in ink, right? And there's always matter. There's always stuff that the circle is made out of, but the circle is not the matter, right? The circle is a different thing. And we know that because we can recognize the circle in all these different kinds of matter. Um, and this is how kind of Aristotle helps us to think about morphe form and hule matter. Um, the pistis, the faith is sort of like the form. Um, it can be embodied, enacted in a million different ways. And that fact is sort of why Protestants are keen, I think, to resist nailing down certain church procedures that are required for something like, say, forgiveness, right? Um, 
Protestants want to say, no, the, the, the morphe is a thing unto itself and might take different forms, or at least might be embodied in different ways. Sometimes you might just be quietly talking to yourself and receiving that ephesus from God, that forgiveness, right? Sometimes uh, you might go to a priest, you might go confide in somebody. Um, and, and it, you know, as I understand it, I think the Catholic position on this is, no, there is a specific kind of embodiment, right, of the specific work that corresponds to this morphe. So if, if the form is the faith, then the uh, matter is the action, is the work, is the way that it works itself out in the world, um, is like the surface upon which that enables us to see. You know, if you have something invisible, you can only see it if there's some sort of physical, tangible thing that surfaces mind. This is why pneuma, spirit, is such a good uh, way of talking about this. Wind, spirit, breath, right? How do you see the wind? Well, you see it move through the rain, right? Uh, that, or, you, or the leaves, right? That You're not looking at the wind, but you're looking at the kind of outward embodiment of it in the material world that it affects. Um, so I, I think that this understanding of faith and works as kind of form and matter um, is both fruitful and basically would be agreed upon by any of the different sects that you've talked about. It could be wrong, right? And tell me I'm wrong. That, you know, Eastern Orthodox people totally disagree with what I'm saying. Um, but I think that this is a kind of baseline thing that's shared. And that then the differences that you have have to do with what you think about the nature of the, that embodiment, right? Can that embodiment happen in an infinite variety of ways, right? Just because, you know, and by the way, just because I say this doesn't mean that it can be anything, right? Faith can't be just anything. It can't be, you know, uh, murdering a child, right? Um, but it could be just like love, right? Love can, can look like a million different things. It can look like a kiss on the lips. It can look like a hug. It can look like giving somebody bread when they're hungry, right? Um, and yet it's something called love. Protestants want to say, well, that's the same with faith, right? There, there's a million different things that we can recognize faith in, even if, um, there are some, many things are not faith. Um, and Catholics want to say, no, that's too wishy-washy. Um, and actually it basically makes faith meaningless or empty of content. And so we always need some, you know, concrete set of, uh, practices, procedures, and rules to embody that, that faith. Now we come to Paul and James, right? I think that Paul, uh, is, stressing the, what Aristotle would call the explanatory primacy of the formal cause, right? Um, he's stressing the fact that pistis as the form, as the, as the kind of, uh, ineffable thing that gets embodied, um, is, is primary in a way that the matter is sort of not, because again, you can do all sorts of different things. And this is why Paul is important for Protestants is because, you know, matter action works, um, are, are not primary in explanation, even if they're necessary, even if they are a cause that you need to explain, you need to, uh, you know, invoke to explain something. Um, the Jamesian approach is the other way around is to say, yes, however, right. Um, if you, uh, you know, if you aren't doing things, you aren't doing something that's recognizable as a work of faith, um, then your faith isn't real. It's not real. It's not really faith or it's dead. Um, I think that the genius of, of scripture is that they give us what is effectively a kind of argument between these two people that is nevertheless a productive argument. Have you ever had a conversation with a friend where you're both saying different things and yet you're saying things that kind of approach to this third reality, right? And, and what you're saying and what your friend is saying and even the disagreements between you or the differences between you are necessary for encapsulating that whole reality. That's what a really good conversation is like. I think that's the relationship between uh, Paul and James. Not that they're writing to each other in those epistles, um, just that the, their, uh, you know, the tension between them is the content of scripture taken as a whole, right? Scripture is giving you Paul and James, right? And the relationship between them is that third thing that I think lets us to understand all the stuff that I've just been bloating about in response to your question.